the 4th edition player's strategy guide. This, this is an anomaly. This book is firmly from a player's perspective, which is a welcome change of pace from the DM heavy fare of the usual supplements. At first glance, it might make you think of the ultimate, insert glass here, guides of earlier editions, but oh no, this is a very different beast indeed. It's widely stated that 4th edition D&D drew inspiration from, and wanted to appeal to, fans of video games and MMOs. This book seems to me to be an attempt to copy the sort of video game strategy guides that you used to get back when we didn't have an internet, and it took more than two days to have a full video game walkthrough on YouTube. These books had level walkthroughs, character art, character creation tips, secrets, collectible locations. I actually had a few of these. I definitely had an X-Men Legends one, and everyone I knew had a Pokemon guide for Gen 1. Anyway, I've got two here preserved in Carbonite for posterity. No, it's not dust. Shut up. Uh, the Arkham City Strat guide that I bought entirely for the Riddler trophies. Pain in the ass they were. Oh, and this one is for Fable Anniversary because nostalgia and gold leaf. Ooh, fancy. Reminds me of Burning Wheel. Hmm, the player's strategy guide looks like these, but because it's D&D and every encounter, gaming group, DM and campaign is different, you can't actually make a walkthrough. What you can do, and what this is, is an optimizer's handbook. To begin with, I couldn't really understand why they did it. Was this the only way to play this edition? Were these extras to help new players go through character creation? Or was 4th edition only played by power gamers? I'm going to flick through it, see what you think. An analog character builder. In my day, we made builds using our imaginations. <laughs> you youngsters have got it easy with all these YouTubers and such. The start of the book goes over all the classes, races and backgrounds in 4th edition. Wait, 4th edition had backgrounds? Huh. Who knew? Moving on. There's a very thorough section on what the different types of powers are for, and also the roles people play in the party. This is one of the main features in 4th edition. Roles. Controller, Defender, Striker and Leader. Generally, roles give a decent indicator to what each class can do at a glance. Leaders lead, defenders defend, and so on. Roles have been criticised as being too defined and even restrictive. A way of pigeonholing players into acting in certain ways. I'll get back to roles later. There were so many powers in 4th edition that they made sets of cards for each class. This trend got carried over into 5th edition for all the different spells you could pick. This is a good choice as it's a lot easier to flick through a deck of cards than search through a book or write everything out yourself. Especially now that the druids and clerics get access to the full spell list for each spell level. Most of the martial powers have gone entirely, but some remain as class specific abilities. Action points, action surge and second wind were available to everyone in 4th, but now only the fighter gets them. Strangely, a two-level dip into Fighter is by far the most popular multi-class option. Meanwhile, the Cleave power from 4E's Fighter ended up as an optional rule in the DMG that's open to everyone to use. That's a fair swap, right? Right? Guys, where are you going? Oh, I like this section on skills. Skill challenges where you needed to succeed on enough checks are another feature of 4th, so I'm not surprised to find this here. This table shows what your skill modifiers should be in order to pass harder checks as you level. Oh, I forgot how crazy high the numbers were in 4th. Plus 27 religion in 5th, please. I want to make the Pope. The skills are not grouped by ability, which is unusual, but by avoidance or staying out of danger, knowledge, observation, persuasion, and, uh, oh. Heal and stealth get dumped into misc. Why is stealth not avoidance and heal not knowledge? Uh, feats, levelling up, paragon paths, epic destinies. <laughs> Behold, I am a god and I have the mechanics to prove it. Pretty unique take for high level play. But did anyone ever get that far? Did anyone else notice that the racial feats from Xanathar's guide are just the racial feats and encounter powers from 4th? Ha! Busted Merles! Multiclassing. Oh yes, multiclassing in 4th edition was just a way to pick up the odd power from another class. It sucked so bad, they introduced the hybrid character as a sort of weird compromise. Pick two classes at creation, and then pick and choose from the powers and feats for either. Oh, so this is interesting. Pages on how to create optimised character types built around certain concepts. Every edition has had this in one way or another. How do I make the fastest or the toughest hero? What's the most healing I can do? Or how do I get the best initiative? Saving throw king. That's a bit dull. Uh, did you roll a one and get crushed? Or is the scorpion what happens on the crit fail? Well, at least it's not raining, dude. If you like to get stuck in with the nuts and bolts of game design, or just puzzles like I do, then you've definitely done this yourself. The rest of the RPG community on YouTube have a ton of builds. Making a specialist is a really easy way to give you a character concept and makes your character more memorable even though it can be stereotypical. With such a uh, singular focus, you'll almost always suck at something else, and having an obvious weak point you can play off can also make the roleplay side of things fun. 
With all the 4E supplements and feats and items, it became more and more of a pain in the ass to assemble a specialised character. Putting it all together, with lots of suggestions to speed things up, wasn't really a bad idea. But the problem with the printed book is that it doesn't update itself whenever something new comes out. Sage advice. The next chapter is Session Zero Party Optimization. You've built your character just right. You've not even started to play yet. They won't be expecting you to strike so soon. Now to micromanage everyone else's fun. For you are the power lord sociopath. Mwahaha. <clears throat> a bit carried away there, didn't I? I said earlier there are four class roles in 4E, and the design kind of encourages you to cover each base. But what if your group doesn't have four? What do we do? This is still a common question in RPGs. We don't have a healer. Do we need one? Someone needs to be a spellcaster. We can't all be fighters. Two of the guys aren't coming, so we only have three players. You know the optimum number of players? Some. And you won't get any if you tell them the characters they made are all wrong and they have to do what you tell them. It's a game. As this guy does actually say, have patience, play whatever you think is fun and allow the other players to do the same. The DM can always fit the story around the characters they have, not the ones they were hoping for. The book freely admits strikers are the most common role in this edition because damage and slayers, power gamers and instigator type personalities are all drawn to them because damage so you're more likely to have more strikers than any other role. But that's okay because damage plus damage equals more damage. Woo, I think I need to go lie down before I damage myself. It does cover another important Session Zero topic, linked stories and compatibility. If your friends all make characters in isolation, you end up with a jumbled patchwork quilt. It's no less fun, but does fall apart with the slightest introspection. Why is my human running around with a gnome, a dragonborn, a half-orc and some sort of cat person? Uh, a wizard did it? If you make them together, you can get a classy tartan with a couple of loose threads for your DM to pull on. And there goes the force metaphor budget for the video. Thanks for watching. The guide puts together four sample parties. All the characters have names and little backstories. It states each one's power and skill choices to play well with the rest of the team. There's even party tactics and who might be good at what. And also how to adjust the party size up or down. Again, you don't want to beat the rest of the players over the head with this bit. It's a guide and an example, not a template you're forced to follow. This could actually be a good guideline for new players not familiar with RPGs that gives them some starting points. An easy pre-gen party for a DM to whip out for a con or a one-shot, and I bet these would also be pretty decent for a solo player who wants to run a full party without having to get into depth with each one at character creation. Oh, I remember this bit most of the artwork. The first two show the whole party. Okay, fine. The next one's been photobombed by Dave a Wizard, who didn't make the cut because she's not actually listed as a team member. While the poor old marked ones Mark the point where the art budget ran out. Tactical retreat. Run away, run away, this is the strategy bit. Might be wargaming rather than storytelling, but the tactical combat part of an RPG, let alone 4th edition, can be just as fun for some players who like a puzzle or challenge it. It talks about role-based tactics. In other words, don't expect your wizard to take a hit, because they won't. In combat, everyone, including monsters, get a turn, one after another, so it's fair. If you have five heroes and five monsters, You'd expect a chaotic fight, as everyone moves around trying to get the slightest advantage to land that killer blow on their opponent. Eh. In my experience, what actually happens is one of four things. Number one. Spreading out. Everyone pairs off and fights a monster one-on-one. -on -one. The highest damage dealer, the one targeting the weakest foe, or the luckiest die roller, drops their opponent first, and then piles in on one of the others. Suddenly, with twice as many attacks coming their way, that one goes down too, and the cycle repeats until the remaining three are dead. Which side has a member drop first is usually the loser. Lots of attack damage is wasted, and until the first foe drops, the whole party is being damaged each round. This can be realistic, but it's also slow and fairly boring. It also depends on how the combatants pair off, who got lucky, and who didn't. If not all of your party are built for fighting, this isn't a good choice either. Steve's down again. Ugh. Already? We've only just resurrected him. Number two. We must each fight the enemy we know. Pair off, but this time, do so knowing the enemy you face is one you're equipped to handle. Have your cleric fight the undead, the monk with the mage slayer feet lock down the wizard. Uh, wait, that's fifth, but whatever, you get the point. This stay on target mentality is a good way to give your side the advantage before the battle begins, as you're more likely to beat your opponent. This can backfire though. If your high damage dealer faces the opponent's minion, they're only going to last a round, while your defender versus theirs is going to take all day, as they have to rely on attrition and a bit of luck. For them, it's who got lucky first and who had the most HP that matters. Each character is still under attack, and it's the squishies that usually conk out first. Number three, focus fire. The diagram illustrates the benefits of the entire party focusing on one enemy at a time. Even though it lasted the same number of rounds, 
The difference between focus fire and spread out in this example is like 10 extra attacks. Focusing fire reduces the potential for incoming damage by reducing the number of opponents earlier on. The major problem with focusing fire is though it's a sound game strategy, it's utterly unrealistic roleplay wise. We're all going to hit this one guy until he dies. What about his mates? Just ignore them. Just ignore them. Uh -huh. Okay, but these guys aren't going to wait until we're done. Ow! Hey, stop it. Stay on target, soldier. But he just... Ow! Later. I'll get you later. Look, just go and wait in the corner until it's your turn. How rude. You'll get yours in about three rounds. Oh yes, and then you'll be sorry. Number four. Thin the herd or go Nova. Your spellcaster or high damage character drops their biggest, best or strongest attack in the first round in an effort to one hit an enemy. You could easily use it to take out lots of low HP foes with area attacks, turn undead, status effects, that kind of thing. The idea is to tip the scales at the beginning of the battle and can be devastating if you get a surprise round or really high initiative. The problem with Nova plays is that it can spoil the encounter. What was meant to be tense and fun and interesting is now a foregone conclusion and isn't much of a challenge. It can be irritating to the other players too, as they might have been actually looking forward to taking a turn, only for you to fireball the entire opposition into a smouldering ruin in one go. It also means that character is out of puff and has to go and lie down to get back all the abilities and resources they cashed in at once. Nova can breed Nova, especially if you have a couple of competitive friends. If you have more than one player doing it, you can even end up with a 5 minute adventuring day if you're not too careful. The book's take on delay and readying is worth repeating. Don't outsmart yourself. Delays can be badly timed and readying can be a turn wasted. I've found delaying is best for setting up ambushes and readying is only worth doing when the trigger is something you know your teammate is about to do. Don't make it some complicated thing that relies on the DM because they won't do it and you'll look like a chump. Or one of your party will steal your thunder by killing the opponent you had a ready on. It's all about action economy. The problem with fights is that they can become a resource tax. HP, healing, abilities, items and encourage a party to rest more than push on with the high tension risky battle against the big bad because everyone's knackered. Common mistakes. D&D players hate to run. Agreed? This guide suggests you put someone in charge of calling retreats because if you don't you're more likely to get a TPK. This is maybe especially important advice for four as the game works best on a grid and you need time to work out distance and direction so you can escape without getting surrounded or taking too many opportunity attacks. Monster rolls? Nope, I've had it with rolls. Next. Troubleshooting your PC. Hello, wizards. My character's got this weird rash and I can't roll higher than a six. No, no, I'm not a warlock. No, I think I'd remember sleeping with a hag. No, there are no bugbears under my bed. You don't think it's a curse, do you? Hello? Hello? They hung up on me. Not being able to hit on goblins, poor tactics and boring and long combats. This guide gives ways to fix these common complaints through tweaking your character, rather than relying on the DM to adjust their encounters to suit you. It's a little power gamey, playing the mechanics, but can be very effective. Giving your character another option to close off a weak spot or to make them more versatile can show progression in the character's skill and add to that hero's story just as well as upgrading to bigger damage dice. D&D is all about stories. You'd know this if you got as far as chapter 4 of this guide. Chapter 4 everyone! After the storytelling, oh, nope, that was it. We get to the often overlooked topic of resting. It talks about too much, too little, wanted to push on. Oh, what's this? Extended rests can result in a loss of tension and momentum at the table, as the party now has full HP and all their powers back, so don't feel under pressure. True, in our games we do tend to end up doing long rests at the end of our, oh, Yep, yeah, that's in there too. The campaign journal talks about recording the game through notes. Again, this is a decent tip. If two of you take some bullet points on important NPCs, events and locations, you've got something to refer back to. That's all you need, really. If the DM looks after it between sessions and added bonuses, they can see what you think is important and interesting from a player's perspective. Getting the party to do their own last game recap is also a fun way to get everyone in the mood to play. Agreed. Next. Magic item wish lists from players. This was more of a thing in 3rd and 4th because you kind of needed items to enhance your character's stats enough to make the maths work. 5th doesn't actually rely on this so much. Ways of dividing treasure can be a sticking point for certain types of players. I'm always a bit baffled by equipment envy in a game of make-believe with non-existent stuff, but it has happened. Our rogue nicked everything that wasn't nailed down and ended up dragging around a crap ton of gold while my elderly dwarven cleric and the shy ranged fighter we played with had about a quarter of that between us. To fix that kind of problem, the strategy guide gives five different options and what's good or bad about them. So we've got the even split, uh, works for gold, but not so much for items of differing value. Uh huh. Random draft. This one can be fun for the right type of people. Roll to see what you get and deal with it. 
This one actually has some merit in fifth because of all the weird and wonderful stuff you get, but in fourth you probably end up with lots of plus one weapons and the odd spell scroll nobody wants. But all is not lost, apathetic treasure seekers. You can melt down magic items you don't want into residium and use it for rituals or as a sort of secondary currency in 4e. We'll put random draft in the maybe pile. Fixed draft. If you're just tuning in, this isn't a magic video. Roll blah at the start of the campaign to see who gets first refusal on blah. Then the next one in the order gets first pick next time and on and on. Okay, so fixed draft is like treasure initiative for the whole time you play. Just pick something, then go round in order until every item's been selected, rinse and repeat. Can't see this working in Adventure League, can you? Nope. <laughs> Next. Get what you need. Ugh. Boring. Next. Oh, last one. DM assignment. Oh, I have the power. Wait, didn't I always have the power? Assign items to a particular character to make sure everyone gets stuff they can use and to stop the team selling off junk they're not bothered about. This does give the DM some wiggle room. You can still have the players roll percentiles for treasure, then you tell them what they find, inverted commas. The illusion of choice is strong with this one. It'll stop arguments cold as long as the DM's not a biased tool bag. Ah, you find a ten foot pole in the giant's pocket. Um, does anybody want to swap? Don't be a jerk. Jeez. They actually have a section called Don't Be a Jerk. Ugh, okay, here we go. At some point, every group that plays D&D has to deal with that player. No, they don't. They kill NPCs without provocation, hog the DM's time, and don't help the rest of the party. They somehow manage to make it less fun for everyone else. Wow, that's pretty damning. I guarantee you'll never see those words written in a wizard's product ever again. It's a gutsy move to not only admit that your game can suffer from toxic players, but to call them out on it in print is another thing. Oh, this bit, this bit here says, if you suspect that you could be acting like a jerk, this section provides a few suggestions. It doesn't go so far as to tell them to knock it off or to sod off, but perhaps that's for the best? It does give some solid ideas to regular issues, but if you have any common sense, you can easily come up with it on your own. Don't take forever on your turn, don't ignore, interrupt or argue with anyone, and don't pinch their stuff. Best two pages in here, hands down. Dead on arrival. The player's strategy guide came out in 2010. 2010. The thing is, the internet had basically already killed this type of book. The D&D forum was already out on the Wizards website, RIP, and covered builds and player tips in greater detail from a wider range of viewpoints. Reddit and blogs and YouTube all had discussions and ideas on how to play the game, and content was being added constantly. A static one-off book just couldn't compete. And worst of all, their advice was free. At the start of the book, they say show, don't tell when it comes to a character's personality. But that's just as true for making them in the first place. How many character creation videos are there for 5th edition? How many cover the best builds or spells or abilities? Even though 4th edition was only two years old at this point, this book makes the game seem bloated under its own weight. The number of supplements and options to sift through makes you want to reach for an online character builder rather than do it by hand. I've ragged on it a bit, but to be fair, most of the player tips and tactics are sound and can apply to almost any RPG. Putting in clear pros and cons for different ideas is also a nice touch. The example parties are an interesting thought, but don't get caught up with copying them just because they're in an official book. They're just ideas. Does wanting a competent, optimised character designed to work with the rules make you a power gamer? Not always. Does squeezing out every advantage from the rules like a lemon make you a power gamer? Yes. But is that always a bad thing? No. But don't go too far. If your friends aren't bothered about having the right pluses in the right places, that's okay. Don't push them on it. You can still pick up copies of this book on Amazon and such, but I can't really recommend it to the casual supplement collector. Most of the core tips are common sense, and a five minute flick through Nerdarchy's GM911 will find all of them. If you're looking to design an RPG and want to make sure it's robust enough to cover common issues, this book will give you some ideas you can use with a decent amount of depth. If you play a lot of 4th edition, you might like the specifics of the builds, and if you play RPGs solo, this book will definitely help you create a balanced team from scratch and is a seriously redeeming feature in my mind. The sidebars from the Wizards team are a rare inclusion for a DMD book, and this is perhaps the only 4th edition book that breaks the unified art style by inviting comic artists to illustrate different topics. Plus one bonus tip, using video game strategy guides for DMD. These sort of books make pretty decent idea fodder for your DM noggin. You can steal story inspiration, artwork and NPCs, which your friends who have played the same game will appreciate. The walkthrough maps can make good adventure locations, I mean, they work for a video game, so they ought to be fun for us analogue gamers too, right? Some games have puzzles or challenge areas that can be converted. Arkham City here has literally hundreds of Riddler trophies to find, and they're usually protected by a puzzle. 
Batman's got his gadgets, but your party has magic and muscles. Some obviously don't work for a group or need heavy editing, but some of these are borrowed straight from the book. Just don't make them crucial to progress your story. That's the most important rule about using riddles and puzzles in D&D. Unless you're going to let them do skill checks for hints or answers, that is. That's another video right there. Anyway, the fable book I bought mostly for nostalgia over the one true fable. <coughs> Lost chapters. Like Robocop, there were no sequels, and that's fine with me. No, honestly, you imagined those. Fake news, fake news, I say. I also bought this book for the items. In Fable, whenever you found treasure, they show up on screen as like little cards with a picture and their stats. Not unlike the D&D collector cards, really. Mullen, you stole this! There's weapons, loads of armour and clothes that grant different effects. I even tried using the sweet tattoos and hairstyles when my adventurers did a quest for a dwarven barber college. So many neckbeards. Right, that's your lot. Pro strats for 4th edition. Better late than never. Is this a Power Gamers handbook? Do you have any D&D books that haven't aged well? Let me know downstairs. Thanks for watching. Take a rummage in my description box for more content on this topic. And subscribe for more Plus One Wisdom. See you next time.